Hello, listeners. Welcome to this episode of Cryptonomics. Before we jump into today's discussion, please keep in mind this recording is for general education and is not intended to constitute investment advice. Any opinions expressed are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of Witham. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Cryptonomics, brought to you by Witham. I am your host, Mark Eckerly, and today our guest is Ryan Shadell, who has been heavily invested in the Web3 space, and most notably is the CEO of Metavesco, a publicly traded company that has gone all in as a Web3 enterprise company investing in various digital assets, NFTs, platforms, um, and generating income as a liquidity provider. So we'll take a deeper dive into what all of that really means, uh, but to welcome to today's show, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having me on. With, with that kind of brief intro, uh, why don't you give us some further background on yourself and kind of your journey into the digital asset space and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I first started looking uh, at crypto, really not even crypto, but the I was interested in the technology, the Hyperledger technology, the blockchain technology and its applications for things like uh, tracking billable hours for employees on a work site and then tracking that billing to the uh, accounts payable team from the client. And so the Hyperledger, the technology behind it, I was probably more interested in than the idea of trading some, you know, currency. Uh, my son told me to buy Bitcoin in uh, probably, was it 2013 or 12? And uh, I wish I had. Uh, would have listened to him because I would be a very wealthy man, uh, but I did not. I actually laughed at it and completely dismissed it, uh, and he reminds me of that frequently. Um, but a couple of years ago, I started looking at it more, and uh, when I actually researched it and spent the time to understand, and it started with Bitcoin. You know, there are a lot of cryptocurrencies, but it started for me at least. It started with Bitcoin and uh, kind of evolved from there. Once I understood the mechanics of it and the intention Um, the purpose of Bitcoin and the idea of a peer-to-peer network of exchanging monetary value without outside interference or oversight it you know I went down that rabbit hole and uh, you know I really never came out the other side so you know that's 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 it for me and that's that's what got me interested in crypto it started with the technology and then it evolved into the you know the economic proposition of it Yeah, I find that a lot. Once someone actually takes a deep dive into the rabbit hole, it's tough to, to come back out. You're kind of, you're kind of all in. It really <laughs> is. It really is. Well, there's so much that you can do um, if you shed the uh, the preconceived ideas that we might have about money, monetary policy. Uh, there's a middleman in everything that we do. Once you shed those ideas and you start thinking um, – on a global scale from a monetary standpoint, you know, the, the things that could be done and the potential economic value that could be unlocked, uh, I, I personally feel, and I'm not the only one obviously, but I feel that there's, you know, tremendous opportunity there, you know, for humanity. I'm not a humanitarian, I'm in it for the money, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of opportunity for the betterment of humanity, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, early on, the whole crypto space kind of had that negative connotation that it was going to be used for the black market, right, with the whole Silk Road scandal. And right. once individuals educate themselves and understand some of the use cases for the what crypto can do as a new form of currency, I think that's really shedding that bad reputation almost and bringing it to the forefront to help get that, that mainstream adoption almost. Right. Well, so – and that's – Probably one of the things that interested me most was and going back to the, you know, my original interest was in the technology. So if you look at Bitcoin, um, it's extremely difficult to hide things using um, blockchain currency, okay, which is what we call cryptocurrency, because it's all on the blockchain. I mean, literally, you can go look at transactions, it's public. Everyone can see you moving money around. Now, it might be, you know, somewhat anonymous to a degree. Um, but you can't really hide a transaction. You know, there's no backroom deal. I mean, it's all out there. Everyone sees it. So it was funny. There was a, about, I think about a year and a half ago, there was a, a hack of, of the Colonial Pipeline, if you recall. And the whole thing was they, you know, they were demanding Bitcoin as the ransom. And they, they, the reason those guys got caught was because they demanded Bitcoin as payment because it's traceable and trackable and, you know. The thing about it, though, it's permissionless. There's no middle person who says what you can and can't do with it. But it is 
viewable and trackable by everyone who wants to see it. And that is powerful if you believe in a global economy um, and the potential that a global economy can bring to you know all corners of the earth. You can move money across borders without an intermediary taking their cut, their 2%, their 3%. It's a currency, and I'm strictly talking about Bitcoin because I, I do classify everything else as a different thing. But Bitcoin specifically, it is a, a currency that is, is not um, poisoned by eight or nine different central banks trying to do their own thing. And, uh, and that's why you see, you know, a lot big swings recently in, um, you know, the Forex market. There's big swings in valuations uh, like USD to Euro, I think, hit parity for the first time in like 20 years. I mean, you know, that's great if you own U.S. dollars. It's not so great if you own euros and you're buying things, you know, in U.S. dollars. But hey, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. Yeah. So. Exactly. Right. It's still denominated in the same same dollar right. value. Um, but I know, so so to help take a deep dive in some of the other assets, because um, I know Metavesco is kind of, like I said, all in on crypto. So there's they're not just focused on Bitcoin. Right. Um, so tackling the crypto space from a few different angles, what are you most excited to explore? Um, and where do you really see the future of the company as a whole from a sustainable operations perspective? Um, there's a lot I unpack there. Um, yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, we are a web, I call us a web three enterprise, and, and I think web three is a very broad umbrella, you know, it, 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 it'd be like saying, yeah, we're an internet company, you know, it's a pretty broad, you know, it could be a lot of things. Um, but, you know, web three, I essentially, you know, look at web three like this, you've got uh, the uh, metaverse, okay, which is the environment, and that's, um, you know, maybe it's VR, maybe it's AR, maybe it's not, maybe it's just a web page. Uh, but it's the environment, okay, and it's a, it's an environment where you can own part of that environment and you interact with that environment with what I would currently say would be NFTs, okay, non-fungible tokens, and you transact in that environment with decentralized finance, which is DeFi. And so if you look at Metavesco, that's really what I'm looking at is those three areas, how can we get exposure to them? And um, so I think, you know, the term metaverse was really, you know, pop culture last year when Mark Zuckerberg, you know, changed the name of Facebook to meta platforms. The thing is, he had talked about the metaverse previously on a uh, earnings call, and that term has been around for a while. So I think we're still understanding or still trying to determine what the metaverse, you know, quote unquote, actually is, will do, what it looks like. And uh, um, there's a company called Improbable. They have put some really uh, awesome tools together uh, and they're working with uh, other side meta Yuga labs I know we'll probably talk about that a little bit to help them build out their metaverse platform but I think in terms of what I'm excited about I definitely think uh, what the metaverse can be what we're building it into be and, it, and, it, and I equate it to being back in like the early 90s you know what's the you know information super highway going to look like you know we eventually stopped calling it that and we call it the world wide web and and then we just I don't we dot com and now i think we just we don't call it anything it just is right so you know i mean that's what we, i mean as far as excitement I, I i'm definitely there in terms of our our operations um so the bulk of our dollars are invested in uh liquidity pools okay and that's DeFi, where we are providing liquidity to the market so if you want to trade a certain pair of cryptocurrencies you're swapping one currency for another uh, we're the middleman there, or we're providing liquidity at least to the middleman. Uh, and in, in this case, it's usually Uniswap, which is a, uh, a automatic market making platform. Uh, we're providing liquidity to the market so that you can come in and out of the market and have good price discovery. Uh, we get a fee for doing that. So we're literally cryptocurrency market makers, okay? Uh, not unlike, um, you know, the big Wall Street firms, you know, Goldman Sachs being a market maker in, in stocks and, and bonds and whatever. Um, so it's kind of the same thing. I mean, literally the same, uh, functionality at least. So that, I mean, it's not as sexy and fun as the metaverse stuff. Okay. But this, the, the liquidity pools, as long as there's good volume, we generate fees off of the capital that we have tied up in those liquidity pools and those fees pay the bills. And the idea is that we're able to take those dollars and we can either compound them or we can take them and, and invest those dollars into NFT products that we like which are currently mostly limited to things that are at least in some way connected to Yuga Labs. Not exclusively, but 
for a large part of it. Um, and so that's kind of the model that we have. We want to put money to work in liquidity pools, and we want to take those gains uh, when we have them and put them into uh, NFT projects that we think have moon shoot oper- you know, potential down the road. And, and I do think it's down the road. It's not next week. You know, we're not going to all be in, you know, Ready Player One next week. That's it's some years away. Yeah, it doesn't happen. I wish overnight. that it did, <laughs> but no, it that's. And truthfully, we want it to take a little while because we need to build up our asset base, you know. So, I mean, as a company, you know, this dip that we had, yeah, it hurt to look at that over the last, you know, what, 60 days, 90 days. I mean, that that hurt to look at that in the portfolio. At the same time, it's like, well, I mean, we are getting a better price point for some of the things that we want to buy. So, if you have a long-term, you know, investment horizon like we do, this is actually an opportunity, you know, and uh, at least that's how I'm able to sleep at night when I see Ethereum down 50% in the last two months. Yeah, I was at a conference um, a month or two ago, and Ryan Selkis from Masari basically said a bear market presents, if you could sustain the hit, a bear market presents right. opportunities for growth and builders to really establish themselves so when the next bull run does happen, everyone's kind of prepared and Ready to go to hit the right, and you'll see that. So uh, over the last probably two weeks, I can't tell you how many articles, how many tweets I've seen where some you know startup firm raised you know ten, twenty. Uh, there's one two days ago, four hundred and fifty million dollars. So yeah, there's a bear market, but there's tons of capital still coming in, and uh, there's a uh, you know kind of it's, it's kind of a meme at this point, but you know in the in the in the crypto community uh, bear market people build in bear markets and that's and and I think that's exactly true and you know much like the dot com bust there were uh, you know most companies didn't make it out of that but the ones that did made people a lot of money and I think we'll see the same thing but also think it will happen faster and uh, and and I might even argue most of it has already happened I think crypto winter is over you can quote me on that, but, uh, you know, and I'm sure, you know, there's been a lot of people who've had to eat crow for saying that kind of thing. Um, you know, we might get a pullback, but you know, in, in the, the dot com bust, I mean, people thought it was the end of dot com. It was a fad. It's over. And, you know, imagine being that there's an article I read the other day talking about emails. Is the email fad passing? Could, could you imagine me the guy that wrote that article? You know, I mean, so is, uh, is crypto, Anything from right, that yeah, point exactly. on has I no mean, at the time, you know, I mean, they didn't have really <laughs> clickbait back then. But, you know, I mean, now you just say it's clickbait. But, mm-hmm. you know, these companies, these platforms are building and um, there will be opportunities if you can figure out how to get access to uh, what they're building. And that's going back to the question about what I'm excited about with the metaverse and the idea of Web3. The idea of Web3 and like the major difference in Web3 and Web2 is Web3, you own your content you have potential or uh, access to own the part of the platform or at least components of the platform and so when I talk about other side meta which is a metaverse project by Yuga Labs the idea that I can own part of that environment that I'm transacting in or that someone else is transacting in I mean that's pretty remarkable for for an average everyday American you know almost quite like this like let's say you go to the mall there's a whole bunch of stores that are selling things right well what if you could just click a button and you owned part of that environment, owned part of that mall or part of that store, you know, or part of the, the ecosystem that was in the mall, you know, that you can do that with Web3. Um, and, and I think larger corporations are starting to realize that and starting to build more and more with that type of focus. Disney recently announced a deal uh, to develop on Polygon. Uh, Mercedes yesterday announced a deal to develop on Polygon, also known as Matic. Um, but, you know, those are... You know, that's a canary in the coal mine if there ever was one for what's coming. I mean, you know, when you see big money start to look at it, it's, you know, they're going to follow into it because that's where the people are going to be. Yeah, we've even seen some financial institutions or accounting firms kind of get some real estate yeah. in the in the metaverse as well. Um, but you, you mentioned Yuga Labs. Um, so I, I, I do want to transition over to that just to give our listeners kind of some background as to what is – Yuga Labs, what is the Board Ape Yacht Club? Um, and kind of understanding the true, I mean, right. this is a great use case, in my opinion, of what NFTs can do and a true value proposition. So can you just give us a little bit of background? Because I know you personally, as well as the company, are, are big on the, um, the future Absolutely. And, and long uh, So Labs. the first NFT was created in 2014. A lot of people don't know that. So it's not, you know, 
it's not that new. I mean, two two years ago, you know, it seemed like it was new. Um, at least the concept of it. The first one was created in 2014. Uh, it was really, um, I would say, reached you know cultural phenomenon status with uh, crypto punks, in, and I think that was 2017. Um, and it really didn't you know get more mainstream. And I don't even know if I'd call it mainstream now. It's still a very small village of people that are in the NFT space. Okay, you know, and we talk about this a lot in the Twitter spaces that I'm on, where you know, I mean, I'll see someone in there. Well, for example. Yuga Labs, I mean, they they raised almost a half a billion dollars uh, in private equity, you know, a few months ago. Okay, so yesterday I'm in a space, um, and so someone who has been in what I call an alpha group, uh, you know, looking for basically information and opportunities for investments, right? Um, he's Illa the producer on Twitter. He's just um, got like a community manager position with Yuga Labs. I've been, you know, friends with that guy on Twitter. On Twitter, I don't know him personally. I mean, we talk on Twitter, but you know, for like a year, and now all of a sudden he's like a community manager for the biggest name in NFTs. I mean, that's how small Web3 is, right? I mean, it's still small. So, um, Yuga Labs came out, you know, uh, early last year. Uh, they launched the Board API Club, and uh, it actually took a few weeks to sell out. It didn't mint out right away. Uh, a lot of people don't know that either. I mean, it, it, it wasn't an instant hit. But it was just, you know, it just had this cultural thing. I can't even really explain it. Uh, and I was late to the party on that. Um, but the community building that they did was uh, just on something on a different level. And so if you look at them now, without question, they are the blue chip uh, NFT company out there. And I don't even know that I would call them an NFT company anymore because they had really have taken what I think is my idea of um, – what this technology can do and can be, and they they have really executed really well. Okay, uh, so other side meta is a project that they launched. This is their metaverse project, and it's all NFT based. Um, so you have a, a, if you go to OpenSea, you'll see the other deed for other side, and that is essentially like your deed for that particular land plot in the other side metaverse, right? Um, so if you've ever played, you know, a video game, imagine you own part of, you know, the environment that you're playing in, part of the city that you're walking to when you're playing Zelda, that kind of thing. Um, but these NFTs are different. They are dynamic NFTs, which have not really been talked about a lot, but I do believe will be the buzzword, you know, over the next 12 to 18 months. A dynamic NFT is an NFT, which is a non-fungible token that can be updated and changed based on actions that you or someone else takes. And so... This is really going back all the way back to the technology of the Hyperledger, okay? It's trackable, it's immutable, you see it, everyone sees it, and you're doing all that with an NFT, with a digital item. And so it's what started out as uh, digital art, you know, in 2014, is now really more about technology that I feel is represented by the, the digital art. And at some point or another, uh, people will still be talking about NFTs not from an art standpoint because what's really awesome about an NFT is just the it's, – it's really just a smart contract. It's a smart contract that dictates if this happened, that happens. And, um, you know, we all know it now as, as art, but that will change as the technology, uh, I feel, matures. Um, so with, with Other Side Meta, it's, it's an opportunity to uh, own part of a, a digital environment that's being created by Yuga Labs. And – these guys have just done an amazing job of execution. Um, they launched their own token, ApeCoin, back in uh, March. Um, they've got the Board Ape Yacht Club. And so right now, a uh, floor, you know, a, a, the lowest price Board Ape, if you wanted to go buy one, it's 145000 It reached at one point, I think, 400000 500000 U.S. dollars. And I, 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 I think that that's cheap, uh, just from a historical significance standpoint, you know. So, um they're continuing to build. They have a huge community that's behind them, and I feel that eventually they'll be the Disney of the uh, of Web3, and uh, I think they will build the world's re first really truly or interoperable uh, metaverse. Okay, and I think that'll be other side meta. It, it'll take them a couple of years. I don't think this thing will be live tomorrow, but I don't think you know Facebook meta platforms is is yeah. really that much further you know far ahead of them. Um, so it's interesting what they've done in terms of building their community, and uh, they have constantly kept that as focus for what they've been building, and, and that has rewarded them and the community, you know, over and over again. So I think there are a lot of NFT projects out there that, you know, I mean, if I'm being honest, 99% of them are going to zero, okay? I mean, they're just, you know, 
there's some art value in some of them, right? But in terms of, you know, what they can build or, or will build, be, once you get beyond the art, it's really about having a team that can do that. And there's, you know, if you're in that space right now, there are only a handful of projects that you want to really attach yourself to. And Yuga owns, you know, most of those. So, you know, MeBits, uh, CryptoPunks, Bored Apes, they own all of that. And uh, I think Other Side Meta is going to end up probably being the, uh, the the biggest thing that they have in terms of, of total dollars, uh, valuation-wise, uh, eventually. But, you know, it's uh, it's early still, and you hear that a lot. It's almost become a meme now. But, you know, I mean, really, Board Ape Yacht Club's been around for a little over a year. It's pretty early. We don't know what they'll end up, you know, finishing with. But they've got a roadmap out. You can go check out their website. They have a roadmap, what they're working on, what they're building. They're constantly communicating. Uh, and then, you know, the whole thing with ApeCoin, the ApeCoin DAO, that's a, I mean, we could, you know, we'll be here till four o'clock if we start talking about what that's going to do, you know? <laughs> okay. I, I do have a couple follow-ups there that I just wanted to get your thoughts on. Because um, I, I do know that Yuga launched the ApeCoin back in April or so. Um, so I'm curious to get what's the what's the use case behind ApeCoin, right? Is that going to be the currency that lives sure. in the metaverse? So they have stated that, like? uh, that uh, it would be the um, the currency used in other side meta. So if you if you have a you know a shop or a game that you built, look at if you think about and this is based only what we've read and what we can read, which is in they did publish a light paper uh, a couple weeks ago. And so the way I figure it is, it's like Roblox, but you actually own the stuff you're building, like in terms of like the, the general ecosystem, right? Uh, so in Roblox, you go, you buy Robux uh, that go to Roblox. You know that's how they earn, uh, you know, earnings. Um, well, in, in this case, you would buy something from someone else who had built something, and you would have to spend ApeCoin within that ecosystem. That is the chosen currency of that ecosystem. And so that's kind of what they put out there. But then beyond that, it's Anything that you want to build within the Board Ape Yacht Club ecosystem, you would use with ApeCoin. So if you want to buy any Board Ape Yacht Club merch, like they do merch drops, it's all in ApeCoin. You have to have ApeCoin to purchase this stuff. And then beyond that, you have people like me who want to build things that use ApeCoin. Uh, recently, there was, a, and, I, and I can't recall it, it's too early, <laughs> but there was a, a firm who created a uh, NFT marketplace for the board apes. And I think they're trying to get ape, the ape coin DAO to fund development of this NFT platform. And so the, the concept is, so OpenSea currently is the largest NFT uh, platform in terms of volume and their customer service is really not great. Okay. Um, so if you built your own, and, and by the way, 10% uh, of the volume that happens at OpenSea comes from the board ape yacht club community, um, you know, through either a, a BAYC or MAYC. So it's, you know, it really just makes sense to have a platform that's owned by the community, not I mean, because having OpenSea own that is very Web 2. <laughs> okay, the community should own it. That's Web 3. That's the whole point of it. These guys built this thing, and they're like, okay, here's a platform. You can list your NFTs. You can, and every fee goes to buying ApeCoin and burning ApeCoin. So they charge a, a fee, and those fees go to buying and burning ApeCoin. So. I think that the utility case for it is it can be whatever the community wants to wants it to be. I mean, that's the beautiful part about it. Um, it there's no central party saying do this with it. Uh, in fact, Yuga doesn't even control ApeCoin. They created the token, but the the coin itself is is managed by a DAO, so it's all decentralized. Um, they uh, appointed an initial um, board of advisors or custodians. I forget what they how they termed it. To kind of guide the the community, but it's all decentralized. Yuga has very little say so over what happens. They have input, and probably, to be frank, if if Yuga said, "Hey, do this with it," the community would probably say, "Yeah, let's do that with it." Although they somebody came out and said, "Hey, ApeCoin needs its own chain," and the community was like, "No, we don't." And uh, there was an AIP that was proposed to to uh, like source, you know, for for an ApeCoin chain, ape chain, right? And uh, the community said, no, we don't want that. It's an ape Can improvement what protocol, an AIP is? essentially a proposal to the DAO. So what happens is if you have an idea, like, you know, let's say, um, let's say that uh, ape, the ApeCoin community wanted with them to be the auditor for the ApeCoin DAO. 
I could go on there and do a proposal. Hey, I think with them will be great. They have a lot of experience in crypto. Let's, they should be our auditor if we ever wanted to be audited. And uh, I could propose it. And if you have ApeCoin, you can vote on that proposal. And if it passes, then it passes. It's pretty great. I mean, it's decentralized management, you know, by the community that, that owns the token that makes up the ecosystem. It's, it's, it's brilliant and simple all at the same time. And the cool thing about it is I think it's – a very a scratch of, of the surface of what can be done um, as more and more firms, uh, more and more communities take to these types of, of things, these types of technologies using, um, you know, essentially blockchain hyperledger technology to decide what the future looks like and what it can. You know, if I put forth a proposal and the community votes on it, the idea is you've already got such huge support. You know, it's not contentious at all. And... Um, you know, companies are catching on. They're, you know, the NBA is launching an NFT. Uh, I think there's a Playboy NFT coming out soon. Uh, you know, I mean, it's beyond the art. You can take um, your your memberships, your monthly subscriptions, your tickets, anything that's collectible. All of those things can be uh, put on the blockchain as NFT. And eventually, it's just a matter of time, you're going to buy a house. And it's going to be, all the documentation will be through an NFT. Because it's trackable, traceable, non-fungible, you can't alter it. And so, I mean, if you've bought a house, it takes you forever to get the title work done and the legal. I mean, it's archaic, you know. It's like, you know, 1900, you know, 1905, yep. you know, uh, protocols here. So, eventually the technology is going to open up those things and it will make for smoother, cheaper transactions on a host of things. Not just, you know, digital art. That's really just the the Trojan horse of it. Yeah. I went through the, the house buying process uh, a little over two years ago, and that really helped open yeah. my eyes for some of the use cases that this technology can do. I don't think right. my deed was registered with the town for yeah. three and a half months. And they ridiculous. After closing. Well, it's because it takes so some person, that was pretty some alarming, person who's getting right. paid whatever per hour to click on the thing and to stamp the thing and to do the thing and to file the thing. And it's through, you know, I mean, yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me why you wouldn't want that stuff to be on chain. And uh, I think it's really just a matter of education. There was a long time where um, uh, Congress was, I think, suing banks to keep them from using computers. So, you know, eventually. Yeah, I, I think any governmental agencies well, they are. are always yeah. a little bit behind. I shouldn't say a little bit. Yeah, they're significantly yeah, well, behind. Well, you know what? You on part that. That's, that's a nice segue into uh, regulation. Um, once the SEC and or the CTFC or whomever, whoever just says that we're in charge of the regulation, we need to figure that out first. Who's in charge of the regulation, and then what is the regulation? Once that is done, it's going to open up so much innovation and so much investment into this space. There are huge funds that cannot put big dollars in this space because of so much uncertainty um, with regulation and, uh, you know, the, there's just a host of problems that, that will get solved once there's regulatory clarity. Yeah, once there's some guidance. But no, that, that is, to your point, a good transition to um, a quick question I had on, so being being a, a public company, right, you're... yeah required for certain disclosures and i know you personally are very open and transparent on the company's operations the company's strategy the things you're interested in what you're looking at um so i'm just curious i mean being very active on social media with with twitter postings you mentioned twitter spaces earlier i believe you also um record some spaces on twitch so you're kind of yeah. educating the masses from every angle as best as you can um but I'm, I'm curious, with all that transparency, what are the pros? And then conversely, what are the cons do you see with that level uh, of disclosure almost? Just being a Web3 company because well, there is limited oversight, right? So you could be giving a little too much well, away where thing about, there's still about a little Metabesco uncertainty specifically. There. We are a Web3 company. And so there's – in generally in Web3, there's – potentially a lot of anonymity. Well, we're also a registered SEC filer. So – we don't enjoy that luxury of anonymity, but our investors and potential investors and shareholders do enjoy all that disclosure and accountability. So, it, you know, it is definitely a trade-off. Um, 
but that's kind of why I set it up this way. Um, okay, so a lot of these DAOs and uh, currencies are going to be deemed securities at some point. I mean, I'm fairly certain of it. Not all of them, but a large chunk of them. And, you know, do you want to have your money tied up in something that invests in the metaverse and then find out that they're uh, an unregistered security and you can't get your money out? All right. <laughs> so, OK, fine. I mean, I would love to not have to file because yeah, it costs exactly. a lot of money to be public. Why can't I just make a token and just be a DAO and just, you know, sell five million dollars worth of tokens? I mean, it's so much easier. And you know what? In 2014, you probably could have gotten away with that. You can't today. Um, at least not without getting, you know, an, an unfriendly knock on the door. So it's kind of a blend. All right. So Metavesco is like a blend web two and web three web two. And the fact that, all right, we're very, um, transparent as we're required to be, um, as a, as a filer to the SEC. But I personally feel like that's not enough. And the thing about web three is if you're doing everything on chain, it's all visible. Remember, if it's on the blockchain, you can find it, you can track it, you can trace it. Our wallet is public information. Okay, so people can see everything that we have in, a, in our wallet, which is, you know, we have multiple wallets, but there are a couple of big ones. And, you know, you can see what we're doing with the money that is in the company. And if you're an investor, I mean, so part of the, the thing we're talking about Twitter and social media, we are an OTC traded company that's in crypto and NFTs which is a very contentious regulatory space right now. To me, I feel like it's, it should give us an advantage with investors that we're just being so overly communicative and transparent. And that part of the pros with that is that if you're looking at a company uh, that's on the OTC, you can, I mean, look, you can see what we're putting our capital in. I mean, there's so many OTC companies you have no idea what they're doing and you find out once every 90 days when they file their quarterlies and usually what you see on the otc at least is they didn't do anything except spend money and issue shares right well most of what we do you can just see it in real time right now if you want to know how our eight coin ethereum liquidity pool is doing you just check it the same way i do i pull it up on zapperfy every morning and i look I, i'm using the same tools everyone else has access to. it's all free that's cool and awesome and hopefully will translate into a more liquid stock, a more vibrant community of shareholders. And I think that is something that um, is going to be a, a new thing uh, and a more prominent thing in the, the trading community. So you look at AMC, they've got an awesome, huge, very vocal community of shareholders. Well, I think every company should strive for that. And I think we can do it and it can just be you know, inherent just because we're into Web3. Now let's talk about the cons to being so out and open. Uh, it's great when everything is going up. Not so great when things are going down. So, um, you know, how do you answer? Uh, you know, somebody <laughs> on Twitter says, hey, you know, your portfolio on Uniswap is down 50% in the last 60 days. How do you answer that? Well, I mean, that's going to come. That's going to happen, you know, if you're out there being that transparent. But I think it opens up the possibility to have those types of discussions with people that you want as investors. And if they are truly investors and not just day traders, I think that they will value that because everyone else's portfolio is down too. So it's not like, you know, not like anyone's immune to the, the drop that we've all seen, not just in crypto, but in everything in the last couple of months. But the idea that you can just sit there and have an open conversation. Now, initially, the SEC did not like this kind of stuff. Back when Reed Hastings, he got a Wells notice for his, he was, is or was, I don't know if he still is, CEO of Netflix, but he got a Wells notice for talking about the Netflix financials on Twitter. And he argued, hey, I mean, it's publicly disseminated. Everyone sees it. Yeah, it's, it's you know, material information, but it's in the public, you know, square. And then eventually the SEC, they'll say, well, yeah, I guess you're right. So, you know, that's another one of those things where it just took, took everybody a little while to get it and i think open and honest community town hall type communication with your shareholder base should just it should just be sop it should be standard operating procedure and uh, that's what i'm striving for as as ceo of metavesco and um i think you particularly should consider that if you're an otc company because everyone just automatically assumes if you're otc it's a scam and i personally i assume the same thing you know stuff i've invested in that's otc i automatically just assume it's a scam um, but if a company goes out of their way to give you access to the, the officers, access to the books, which are on blockchain, 
I mean, where else can you get that? Right now, it's a huge selling point. But eventually, I think more and more companies will do these types of things, and it'll just be the norm. Or it should be. I think it should be the norm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think having that level of disclosure is great from investors, just from a general um, like best practices point of view almost. Right. Where right, we have nothing to hide. We're fully here. We're in the crypto space, and I know – Again, back to my earlier point, there was that early negative connotation, but yeah. you could see what we're spending our money on. You could see what we're, we're sitting on. And having your full, full portfolio basically published, I think you, you, you post it yourself on a pretty regular cadence. Um, yeah. But as well, just having anyone else wanting to log in and see how our assets are doing and performing, um, up or down, good or bad, whatever it may be, just helps provide that level of assurance to your investors, to your shareholders. Right. Of, of how well, we're doing and where we're going. Do you want do you want shareholders or do you want co-owners? I want co-owners. Some companies might just want shareholders. You know, you're Procter and Gamble. You probably just want shareholders. Okay, you know. Um, but look, we're we're a publicly traded startup that's doing something that, that you know for the moment at least no one else has done. There's no other U.S. based you know fully audited public company doing what we're doing. So you know, let's have co-owners. I mean, technically, when you own a share of stock in a company, you're a co-owner. At least you, that's how it used to be. Now there's like, you know, Series A prefers that give voting control to Mark Zuckerberg, stuff like that. But, you know, for the most part, if you want to share in the company, you, you're a co-owner. So why can't we have, you know, have conversations like you would with the, if you co-own the, uh, you know, convenience store down the street? You know, you go and you talk to the owner. I'm, yeah, because I'm a co-owner. So uh, why can't we do the same thing? The technology is there now where you could have a conversation with, you know, 10,000 people at one time if you wanted to on, on you know, uh, discourse or, um, you know, different platforms that are out there. I mean, you, you know, an investor connect, look at what AMC has done. There's 75,000 something people on there. I mean, it's insane. So, I mean, why can't we, why can't we look at shareholder um, activism from the inside out? That's, that's how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I do have one more quick question for you um, before we wrap up. So I personally, I just think with where the market has been over the last two to three months, I think this really opens the door for, for some DeFi opportunities, right? Kind of removing that centralized piece, even though that's the whole ethos of crypto as a whole, right? I want to self-custody. I want to kind of get away from someone else holding my assets and having title right. over those, um, which helps bring in the, the DeFi capabilities. So that's one thing that I'm pretty excited for, but I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what you're most looking forward to for the rest of 2022 um, and where you kind of see the year playing out. I know you mentioned earlier that you think we're, we're out of our crypto winter, but what does that really look like? Um, so I think the crypto winter was caused by two things. One is just the overall market macro caused by the Fed, mostly raising rates and inflation. Uh, and I think that that exposed, you know, it's like a, I think it's Warren Buffett. When the tide goes out, you see you see who's wearing clothes and who's not. And so um, there were a number of firms that went belly up um, or, and are in the process of going belly up. Voyager most recently, uh, 3AC, you know, 3 Airs Capital, Celsius. So all these firms, they're, uh, they're centralized finance companies pretending to be decentralized finance. And, uh, you know, you'd mentioned this previously. You know, I think that kind of illustrates the whole reason why we need decentralized finance. I mean... It, it really just makes sense. Has there been a DeFi company go belly up in the last 90 days? The answer is no. All of these companies that are having trouble are centralized, masquerading, and pretending to be decentralized. And and this goes back to my earlier statement about you know how blockchain DeFi can unlock value for humanity. There are people in countries uh, that are just unbankable, and with crypto, and I'm mostly talking about Bitcoin, but with DeFi and crypto, those everyone is bankable. There is no unbankable, okay? And it's not so about you know whether somebody can write a bad check or not. It's just about the ability to move money around and have access to economic freedom, have self sovereignty, and and that's really what crypto for me at least that's the ethos of crypto. So you're talking about what what that means you know for the rest of the year in in crypto winter. I think crypto winter is mostly over because it was exacerbated. Uh, it was started by you know Fed hiking rates and exacerbated by all these other you know, uh, cause and effect things from three arrows and Celsius and everyone else. And there might still be another, you know, shadow bank out there that blows up at some point. But if there were going to be a DeFi blow up, we would have seen it already. 
And so you combine that with uh, what I am most excited about is the emerge of uh, Ethereum. So uh, I just read today the last testnet is supposed to uh, merge uh, August 6th, I think, between 6th and the 9th. And so um, the developers have said that Ethereum 2.0 will be here in September. Man, that's going to open up so much potential. There's so much, um, so many things that can happen. And, and, the, and the thing I'm most excited about is the things that we don't know about yet that will happen once that merge is done. Because here's what I think it will open up. Uh, I think we will see how scalable Ethereum can be. Uh, we already know currently, at least right now, it is in terms of you know the world computer. There is no no more secure uh, platform you can be on. Okay, there just isn't, and um, it's decentralized. So if we have that happen in September, I think you will see a ton of capital come into the space for building applications on the Ethereum network. Uh, I think so. Right now, most DeFi activity probably doesn't happen on Ethereum because it's expensive to transact. So if you want to do a transaction, you go to a layer two, like, you know, Solana or you know, whatever, uh, one of those things. Um, and they know those are great networks and everything, but they're not Ethereum. And the minute uh, Ethereum can process 100,000 transactions a second, so there's just no need for, you know, these layer ones or layer twos, you know, that are on Ethereum in the first place. There's just no need for them. So um, I think that a lot of capital will pull out of the other... Um, the other uh, no, protocols, and I think that money is going to end up in Ethereum in terms of applications being built, and I think a lot of it will be DeFi applications. Um, one of my favorite yield optimizer uh, platforms is Beefy.com, and they have zero zero vaults available on Ethereum, and it's because the transaction fees are just so high. And uh, you know, it, there's more capital trades on Ethereum every day than all the other networks. Um, so you know, why? Uh, why, why leave the blue chip if it can be just as fast as everything else? And that's the question. Can it be as fast and can it be um, as cost efficient? Now, I don't think it's going to be as cost efficient, at least not yet. But once, and this is the, the thing I'm excited about, once that merge is done, we'll be able to see how scalable it can be. And I think people will start to build and we will see that those gas fees will come down. And, uh, you know, I'm just excited about what can be built when, when the speed is uh, increased that much. Because right now it's pretty slow. I mean, it's... You know, twice as fast as Bitcoin, which is still slow. So, 100,000 transactions a second. Um, you know, I don't think we'll have that right away, but that's the goal. That's what uh, Vitalik has said was the goal. So, you know, um, I'm excited about what, what kind of innovation that's going to bring. Yeah, that's one of the things with, especially on the Ethereum blockchain. I know that Bitcoin has experienced it too, and some of the others have, where depending on where the market's at, the transaction fees are just so outrageous, where you're you're basically kind of, stuck and you don't want to pay sometimes transaction fee is more yeah. than the transaction that you're trying to do <laughs> it's there were times uh you know in the nft bull market where yeah i mean it was you know so right now i mean you can send uh you know a hundred thousand dollars worth of ethereum for about five bucks which is still cheaper than sending somebody a wire but that's expensive so um you know that should be about 50 cents right and um you know, there are a lot of really good uh, alternatives to Ethereum where you can send that type of capital for, for 50 cents. Um, but, there, you know, I mean, Solana, you know, and I knock Solana a lot, okay? The problem, the biggest problem with Solana is just not, it's not decentralized, right? It's just not. And, uh, you know, they shut down the network every every couple, you know, weeks, it seems like, you know, they have to pause the, the chain. And, uh, you know, none of these other competitors to Ethereum are what ethereum can be they're better than ethereum now if you're just talking about measurements of of you know key performance you know indicators but they can't be anything better than what ethereum can be and so you know i'm a bit of an ethereum maxi on that from that standpoint it is the world's computer and i think it's going to be a super fast computer there's just so much capital there and i think even more is gonna you know end up there once this is done but it's you know there are um there, there are a lot of, uh, I think, layer twos that, that will help build Ethereum, you know, um, like Maddox and other, you know, Polygon. That's, they're doing some really cool stuff that's development focused and not so much um, transactional in nature. And I, and I think that uh, Polkadot's another one. Man, they've got some really cool stuff going on over there for, for if you're into gaming and then metaverse stuff. I mean, it's 
some really cool stuff that they've done with these uh, these chains. So, you know, I mean, it's still early. Uh, I think most of these will be gone. But uh, the big ones um, that get the most innovation and the most adaptability will survive. Yep. Well, I know we covered a lot today. We talked about a lot of different things, and I appreciate you joining me. Um, where can where can our listeners learn more about Metavesco? Learn more about you? Can you? What, what are your socials? Yeah, so uh, Metavesco dot com and uh, on Twitter uh, at Metavesco, and my personal Twitter is at c ryan Chadle. Um, we do uh, uh, a weekly spaces uh, every Monday at 11 a.m. And uh, we've got a, an email list you can subscribe to on the website. Uh, I'm on Twitter, you know, pretty much 24-7. <laughs> so, uh, you know, always available for questions, connecting, uh, discussion. You know, there's I can spend all day talking about crypto, NFTs, and metaverse. And, uh, you know, anything that's a fruitful discussion, I am up for it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for listening today on today's episode of Cryptonomics and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. All views expressed in this podcast by Mark Eckerly or his guests are solely their opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Witham. This podcast is for informational purposes only.